Okay, welcome everyone to another edition of TechSoup Connect Australia. We are absolutely delighted today to be hosting Rebecca King of Moonbeam Monday. And I'm your host, Kat Milner from Create Your Change. I'm one of the hosts here with TechSoup Connect Australia. And it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce you to Rebecca. Now, Rebecca has lived with crippling anxiety and depression for over 20 years, and she eliminated it when she discovered how to take control of her thoughts and master her mind with the help of a life coach. So Rebecca now dedicates her time as an NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming Practitioner and Life Coach, to supporting others who are having a similar journey to help them identify what's holding them back so they too can retrain their brain and live a truly inspirational life. Now, for today's topic, eliminating procrastination, procrastination creates overwhelm, leading to anxiety and can ultimately become health issues and affect all the other areas of your life. Raise your hand if you've ever been so overwhelmed with everything you have to do that you don't know where to start, so you just don't. (laughs) Okay, I am so excited about this topic today. So if you're feeling that way and like procrastination is getting in in your way and creating a lot of overwhelm, stress, and anxiety, you are definitely in the right place. So let's waste no more time and jump into it with Rebecca. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kat. It is fantastic to be here. As Kat said, I'm Rebecca King. I'm from Moonbeam Monday Training and Coaching. Now, I did want to start off, Kat's done this for me, but I want to know who here would actually class themselves as a procrastinator. I'm guessing that if you're on this call, that's how you're classing yourself. Yes. So I want to thank you for actually owning up to that and to somebody who actually avoids tasks. But most of all for taking, sorry, for identifying that you need to take action, that it's time to do something and saying enough, I'm ready to make a change because that is a big part of this. It takes real courage to do that. So thank you for being here today or for listening to the recording if you're watching this afterwards. I know that we have a lot of competing priorities and there always seems like there's a million important things to do, but the more you put things off, the longer that list gets, yeah? It just grows and grows and so do those feelings of overwhelm and anxiety. And I'm guessing that if you're here, you have felt, as Kat said, you felt that anxiety, you felt that overwhelm. And I totally get it. I've been there. As Kat said, I spent a lot of my life before now living with anxiety. And it became way too much for me. And I finally did something productive about it. And that has led me to do what I do now, which as Kat introduced, I'm now a life coach and NLP practitioner. So I help people work through things like anxiety, overwhelm, depression, working out what their purpose in life is. And that's what's brought me here today talking about procrastination, because it's not simply just talking about the anxiety, the overwhelm, it's what's causing it. Okay. Now, I just wanted to share this before we get going. It's a a little testimonial from a client that I was working with for a little while, who was having avoidance issues. She was procrastinating and she had her own business but she was finding anything to do other than what she needed to do, which is, of course, is procrastination. And she was getting distracted from it. Yep, I can see people are resonating with that. And she was getting distracted, couldn't make decisions without the input of other people. So when this client implemented some of the tools and tips that I'm going to talk to you about today, this is what she had to say. She said, girl, this was a message that she sent me out of the blue. Girl, what have you done to me? I'm getting stuff done. Zero distractions. I'm making decisions. And I don't care about what other people think anymore. And I was so excited to receive this message because it had been such a problem. So I'm I'm guessing that there's people on here today who would love to be able to send this message to me after they've implemented some of these tools. So does that sound good? Cool. So we'll begin. Awesome. Thank you for the thumbs up. Now, we know that procrastination is a huge problem for so many people and it's costing us big time. It doesn't just cost us financially, though. It costs us emotionally and physically too. 20% of Australians identify as a procrastinator. So I know that we've got some people outside of Australia here, but just to put this into context, 20% of Australian population is 5.6, over 5.6 million people, which is more than the current population of Melbourne, a whole city. 
Okay, so let's just break this down. If you work in an organization that has 100 employees, and this is all based on a study, but I'm going to use averages here. So let's say you work in an organization that has 100 employees, 20%, you've got 20 people that are regularly procrastinating. Now, most of these people in the study, the majority said that they procrastinate at least one hour a day. So if you take 20 people procrastinating an hour a day, five days a week, and let's just assume that they're full timers, that's 100 hours a week of lost time. Okay, so if you look at the average hourly rate in Australia of $36 an hour, over a year, that's a financial cost to that organisation of almost $180,000, okay? It's a massive cost to the organization that could pay a couple of people for a whole year's worth of salary. So you can see that it's costing a lot of money. Now, also on top of this, 20%, sorry, 25% of adults say that procrastination is a defining characteristic of their personality. Now, I want to point out here that your language is so important. Okay, labeling yourself as a procrastinator is giving yourself permission to act like somebody who is worthy of that label. Okay, does anyone here actually want to be known as a procrastinator? I'm guessing not. I certainly don't. I don't want to be the one known to put things off all the time. But when you identify as a procrastinator and you continually tell yourself that you're procrastinating, you can be sure that this pattern will repeat itself. That is how your brain works. Because what we believe, we prove. Okay. So our language, both external and internal, is vital to becoming aware of an issue that we want to change. Okay. So procrastination as well as any other issue. So moving forward, when you hear yourself identify as a procrastinator, I want you to reframe this. Okay, so instead of generalizing and saying, I always procrastinate, try, I haven't completed that task yet, but I have a plan. Okay, and I'm going to give you some tools to set that plan today. Now, here are some other alarming facts about procrastination. Studies indicate that chronic procrastination can severely impact your mental health it can exacerbate stress, as we already said at the beginning, and it can actually lower a person's general well-being. And I don't think that's something that we usually put together with procrastination. We just think that we're avoiding things, but it can actually have a big impact on your health. Chronic procrasti procrastinators are more likely to suffer from issues like headaches, colds, and even digestive issues. And I guess if you think about it, that makes sense, right? Because when you feel anxious, what happens to your tummy? you get that butterfly feeling, you get that feeling of anxiety. Our gut is generally where we feel these things. And yes, thank you, Kat, that feeling of things hanging over your head is exhausting. It is. And a 2015 study also shows, and I was blown away by this, there's a correlation between chronic procrastination and cardiovascular disease and hypertension. So we're talking some serious health issues here. All right. And it's also been linked to underperformance and negative self-esteem. Okay, so the more we put things off, the worse we're performing. And not only this and the financial cost to the organisation, which we talked about earlier, if you're struggling with anxiety, you could potentially be having to visit the doctor. You could be taking time off work, especially if you're a casual, for example, and you don't get sick leave, then that could potentially be hitting you in your pocket as well. So emotional, mental, physical, and financial issues simply from avoiding tasks. So whether you're an employee, an employer, or just somebody who wants to achieve more in their personal life, I think we can all agree that this is a big problem and it needs to be addressed, yes? Yeah, of course. So when you have the steps from today, Will it be as simple as just rocking up tomorrow and everything's good and you're a changed person? No. All right. Because learning any new skill, this takes work. Okay. It takes commitment. It takes a deep desire to want to change, but it is possible. All right. And to help you along the way, I do have a special offer for you at the end. 
Now, I just want to point out that procrastination is not a result of laziness, okay? I think a lot of us have felt that or even said that to ourselves, I'm procrastinating, I'm a really lazy person. But it is simply not true. And in fact, many people who procrastinate are far from lazy. They're simply highly stressed or overwhelmed with the amount of things that they've got on their list. So if you struggle with procrastination, you are neither lazy nor alone. But why do we procrastinate? Okay, there's a variety of reasons, of course, but I'm only going to go through a couple today. Instant gratification is one of the biggest reasons, okay? It's the desire for immediate positives being stronger than our desire to delay negatives. So what does that mean? It means that if you dread something, which is the negative, if you dread responding to a full inbox of emails, for example, you're more likely to put it off until later. But if you look forward, which is positive, to your yoga class, for example, then you will want to do it as soon as possible. And in a world full of instant gratification, Facebook, Instagram likes, that kind of thing, where we receive a dopamine hit from something as simple as that, it can be really hard to turn this around, okay, because we're so used to getting that instant hit. But that instant gratification is really short-lived. It's actually what we call a short-term mood repair, right? So think about it. In that example I gave, you still have to answer your emails, don't you? You know, it's part of your job, right? If we're talking in a work scenario, but avoiding it and doing something else that you deem as positive repairs your mood for a little bit longer, okay? It makes you feel good. And who doesn't want to feel good? This means that you avoid your work stress for a little bit longer. And as I said before, people who procrastinate are usually those who are under stress, and no one wants to feel like they're under stress, do they? So that's why we go with that positive, that instant gratification, that mood repair. Okay, and that short-term mood repair is protecting you, okay, against that feeling of stress, against fear of failure, against judgment from others. And so that's why we do it. And we're not even conscious of this, okay? This is our unconscious mind. Now, another thing that comes in here, I'm just... Curious to know, does anyone here categorize themselves as a perfectionist? Has anyone ever said I'm a perfectionist? Yeah, okay. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> now, procrastination can also reduce that stress of can I do it perfectly? Or will my boss like the outcome? Or what will the team think? Okay, these are all things that we think when we feel like we need to do it perfectly. And of course, it's protecting you from thoughts like, can I even do this? Do I have the skills? Do I have the knowledge? And you're actually doing something against your thinking brain's awareness. It's the left side of your brain, the ego. Okay, it's jumping in to save you. And you let it because it momentarily relieves the All right, it's not rational. It's not logical because it takes effort to procrastinate, doesn't it? Because you've still got everything on your mind. It's taking that energy and effort, that list of things that you've got to do. It doesn't leave your mind. Even if you're not consciously thinking about it, you are unconsciously thinking about it. But your efforts in this case are going in the wrong way. So let's begin with step one. Okay, step one is understanding your purpose, the purpose for the task, the project, the goal. Okay, purpose is, an important, is important in every aspect of our lives because it provides that underlying sense of peace and fulfillment and it gives us a continuous development for our being as such. Now, Tony, Robin, Tony Robbins, who I'm sure most of you, he sums purpose up really nicely when he says, when you truly know your purpose, you'll experience a sense of clarity like never before. You'll feel passionate, driven, and laser focused. You'll stop battling with the past and the future and start living in the present. And that is the greatest gift that you can give yourself. And I'm sure we've all heard about living in the present, being mindful, and this is what purpose does for us. Now, I know that in this particular example, Tony's talking about purpose in the larger sense, but it's relevant when overcoming procrastination too. Okay, if you're tasked with completing a project at work, you must be clear on what the overall purpose or objective is. 
Okay, if you've got any doubt on why you're doing it or what the expected outcome is or the impact that it's going to have on the team or the organisation or the, the people supporting it, then you're going to put it off and do something that you have a clear purpose for. And when you know your purpose, you can ask questions, intelligent questions, which provide clarity. Is this still important to me or the organisation? I know that I've come across this when I've had a massive to-do list and I keep putting tasks off. It might be a month or two or even three down the track when I finally, I've ticked all those urgent things off and I get to the list and I go, okay, I better do this. But by the time that's passed, is that task even still relevant? What is the purpose? Is the objective still relevant to you or the organisation? Ask yourself, is it the most important thing right now? Okay, and we're going to talk about important versus urgent in a moment. And then these two questions are really uh, eye-opening when you ask them. Firstly, what would happen if I didn't do this? And what would happen if I did? All right, because when you ask those questions, it really teases out that underlying purpose. Okay, and it will tell you whether you actually need to do this now or whether it can wait or whether it needs to be taken off the list. So just to summarize step one, understand the purpose of the project, the goal, the task, whatever it is that you want to achieve before you even begin. Okay, purpose is going to pop up in all of the following steps. So if you don't nail purpose now at the beginning, you're going to get stuck further on. Okay, so I'm going to keep moving through. Step two is understanding the difference between important and urgent, as I alluded to. Now, Stephen Covey, who is the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, describes this the best in the following way. He says, urgent matters are those that require immediate action. Okay, these are the visible issues that pop up and demand your attention now. Often urgent matters come with clear consequences, don't they, for not completing the tasks? Think about if you get a fine, you have a deadline to pay that, right? And if you don't pay that, there's a consequence, you get another fine. If you leave it too long, you may even end up losing your license. It could be the same with an invoice. If you don't pay an invoice, you don't get the product, you don't get the service. Okay, you get a late. Important matters, on the other hand, are those that contribute to your long-term goals and organisational values or personal values if this is a personal goal. Okay, these items require planning and thoughtful action. When you focus on important matters, you manage your time, your energy and your attention rather than just mindlessly expending these resources. So, of course, what is important is subjective and it will depend on your personal and your organisational values and goals. In a team environment, it is really important to define urgent over important from the beginning of the project, okay, because you might all have different ideas of what's urgent versus important. And in fact, many people do have a problem with making the distinction between important and urgent. And also a lot of people focus on being really busy with urgent things, right? Okay, if you've ever been to one of my events before heard me speak, you'll know that I really don't like that word. I don't use busy. That's why I use <laughs> quotation marks. Okay. We get busy with urgent things, which has the added benefit of making our work seem really important, but it distracts us from the actual important tasks that may require that time and reflection to think about in order not to miss important details. Now, on a practical level, a really useful tool to help you determine this urgent over important is called the Eisenhower Quadrant. Now, this isn't my model. This is available to everybody online. And as the name suggests, there are four determining factors. And we start with your urgent and important tasks. So these are the ones that have a deadline and have consequences for inaction. So in a workplace scenario, it might be that your website is down. Now, in a not-for-profit space, our website is super important because often this is where we take donations, right? So if we're in the middle of a campaign and our website goes down, this is a very important tool to take donations. So it becomes urgent that we get the website back up and running. Next is your important but not urgent tasks. Okay, so these are tasks 
that enhance your life and should have specific time set aside for these. In a personal sense, think of spending time with your family or in an, an NFP sense, it might be making donor calls. Now, donor calls are very important because they build rapport with our donors. They give us the opportunity to tell our donors what's happening and how they're making a difference. But you don't always necessarily have to do them right now, today. Okay, so beginning to see the difference between urgent and important. Cool. The next one is your urgent but not important tasks. Okay, these tasks need to be done, but they can be delegated to someone else. So you might be able to free up your time and concentrate on other things if you delegate these tasks to someone else in the team or even a third party outside of the organisation. And then lastly, there's the not urgent, not important. Okay, so either delete these tasks from your routine or delay them until your urgent and important tasks are completed. So just to summarise this, a very easy summary here, define your urgent and important tasks. And you can use colour coding or anything that helps you with this and consider the Eisenhower quadrant to help you define these tasks. Okay, start with purpose and then define what is urgent versus important. Then we move on to step three, which is clarity. So even Tony Robbins mentioned clarity in his little statement about purpose. You must be clear on what it is that you're trying to achieve. Okay, we've already talked about the purpose of a goal and this is very closely related. Many of us procrastinate and avoid tasks because we don't actually have a clear understanding of what our desired outcome is or what specific tasks are required to get us to that outcome. We have an idea, but do we actually sit down until we're made to do it? And usually we've procrastinated on doing this, but do we actually sit down and write every single little task that's required to get us to our outcome? We often confuse this label and often confuse this and label it with overwhelm. Okay, and we talked about overwhelm at the beginning. It's that feeling. It's a really heavy feeling that gets us. And remember I said at the beginning also how important our language is. When we're constantly telling ourselves that we're overwhelmed, that is exactly what you will be. That is exactly how you will feel. So be sure that you're labeling things correctly, if at all. Okay, because the truth is with this, it's because we lack purpose and or clarity. And this is fixable. Okay, so in a work sense, if you've identified that you're avoiding things because you don't have clarity, it is time to book a meeting with the project manager, the team leader, whoever, you know, is in charge and is going to help you get through this, okay? And you want to ask a lot of questions. Now, I've put nine questions up here. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but hopefully we'll be able to share this presentation with you and you'll be able to take note of them. These particular questions, talking about the objective of the project, what are you specifically required to complete? Is there a budget? Are there deadlines? Is anybody else involved in this? Are there dependencies? Suffice it to say that you need to confirm these things. You need to ask these questions and be as specific as possible. Okay, the more specific you are, the easier it will be to get on with your tasks. And you could use this at the beginning of starting any project or even a personal goal. If your personal goal is to trek to base camp, for example, there are going to be a number of things that you need to do in preparation for that. So you could use all of these questions. Of course, you might, might not be talking to your boss about it, but you could be sitting down and asking these questions yourself. All right, having a clear sense of the impact each of these tasks is going to have on your overall goal or the overall project or the, the purpose is going to help you find the motivation to complete the task. And that's an important part, isn't it? The motivation. Who here says to themselves, I'm not feeling motivated. I'm waiting for the motivation to kick in. I'm guessing that there's a lot of people here that resonate with that. But the truth is, Motivation comes from taking action, okay? <laughs> I love that comment, Kat. It's like you're in my brain. I know. I've been there, remember? The motivation, when we're sitting there waiting for the motivation, we're actually in the wrong place. 
okay, we're in the wrong side of our brain. We need to take action so that we get the motivation from that, all right? And you'll find once you actually start, once you take that first, that second, that third step, you will be motivated. I'm sure you've all experienced that. Okay, so don't wait for the motivation. It's not coming until you take action. All right, and once you have this information, you will have clarity around what it's going to take to complete the project or achieve the goal. Okay, so to summarize the clarity point, if you're feeling overwhelmed, it's likely that you still need clarity. Set a time with your upline to get answers to your questions. If it's something that's in your personal life, you might need to take some time yourself to sit down and do it or ask for some help. And I'm going to get to that point shortly. Be very specific with your questions. Okay. And if it's still unclear, revisit your purpose. Okay. Cool. Let's move on to step number four, realistic timeframes. Now, I didn't just want to call this timeframes. I wanted to call it realistic timeframes. Okay, deadlines help eliminate a lot of procrastination because procrastination is actually an unconscious preference for immediate gratification over potential future rewards, as we talked about in the beginning. So if you think about it, I'm sure that you've all put something off because we can't see an immediate benefit, yeah? A common one, if I think about it, is going to the gym, right? Or eating a piece of cake, okay, thinking... I don't feel like going to the gym now, even though I promised myself I would, I'm going to go tomorrow or I'm going to eat the cake today because it's in front of me. I'll start eating better tomorrow. Okay. This happens because you want to feel good now because we all want to feel good now, right? So staying home or doing something other than going to the gym feels better. Eating the cake now feels good. There's no instant benefit to saying no to the cake right now. It's only when you go to the gym regularly or you consistently eat fresh, healthy, nutritious food that you start to see and feel a benefit. Am I right? It takes time, okay? So go into your goal or your project or your task with your eyes open, okay? Be clear on the time frame around achieving your goal or completing your project, Okay, so what do you need to consider in order to set realistic timeframes? You need to be clear on how long the goal is going to take to achieve. Okay, now I know that most people these days, we class ourselves as time poor, right? We stuff our diaries with so many things and there's other reasons around that. That's a whole other webinar. But we class ourselves as time poor. So if we don't have realistic expectations of the time that it's going to take to achieve our goal, along with the purpose, we're going to find excuses, okay? We're going to procrastinate. Then we need to schedule time to complete the task. Put it in your calendar, okay? When you take the time to diarize it, you give your unconscious mind a helping hand. It's harder to say no to something that isn't in your calendar. My calendar is, I love colors, right? I'm a visual person. It's color-coded and it's blocked, there's a thing called time blocking. You might be aware of it. And I have literally got everything in my calendar. It tells me when I'm going to wake up, the meditation I do in the morning, how long I need to eat breakfast, shower and get ready. Admin time if I've set that. It's got my lunch. It's got my snack times. It's got my dinner time, my gym. I could go on. My calendar looks very full because my life is full. Okay. If it's not in the calendar, it may as well not exist. Then be realistic with your scheduling, okay? We come back to the realistic part. We consistently underestimate how long something is going to take us. You know, this is where this comes in. Don't schedule half an hour first thing every morning at work to read and go through your emails. If you know that the first half an hour of your day is taken up answering the phone or returning messages or having a chat in the kitchen, having a coffee, because you're not going to get to that. And then you're going to have a meeting or something after that. So everything gets pushed. And quite frankly, I don't know about you, but it often takes me more than half an hour to get through my emails and respond meaningfully. So be realistic. If you know it's going to take you an hour to do a task, 
set an hour. If you're going to have a meeting that you know is going to take an hour and a half because there's a lot to get through, don't schedule it for 30 minutes because you're setting yourself up to fail in the first place. Okay, and it's this fear of expectation of failure that creates procrastination as well. And then treat this appointment, whatever's in your calendar, like you would brushing your teeth before you go to work. All right. Who here would go to work without brushing their teeth? Nobody, I'm guessing, right? We would all brush our teeth before going to work. So treat your appointments or your to-do list or your schedules like you wouldn't miss it for anything, you brushing your teeth. Now, I've had a question that's come in here. Thank you. How can you adjust for chronic illness? For example, I may have time booked out for something, but then have a chronic fatigue flare up and I can't do anything. Absolutely. Thank you for asking that question. It's a really good question. I acknowledge that things come up. Okay. We feel ill. We have illnesses, urgent matters come up and we need to move things around and that's okay. All right. And this is where having these things scheduled in your calendar works really well because you can literally move your appointments around. Okay. But don't delete the task, simply move the task. Okay. So if you need to take even a full day out, or it might be longer, but let's just say you had all of these things scheduled in your calendar and you now need to take a full day out. You will need to take time to look at your calendar when you're feeling well enough to move those items. Don't simply delete them. This is when you go back to the Eisenhower quadrant and you decide what's still urgent, what's important and what you can give away. Because there may be things in that day where you go, do you know what? It was important on that day but it's no longer important, okay? So you can shift things around and I acknowledge that sometimes things will have to come off the list. So I hope that helps a little bit with that question. Thank you. Cool. So to summarize this one, procrastination is a form of time inconsistency. It's that unconscious preference, as I said, for instant gratification over potential future rewards. So in order to eliminate procrastination, you must be in tune with your purpose. I told you this was going to come up throughout the whole thing. When scheduling, make sure you understand how long that project or the individual tasks are going to take you and be realistic, okay? Really take the time to understand how long it's going to take you and be okay with the fact that if you haven't scheduled enough time, you may need to schedule more time. That's okay. Don't beat yourself up about it. Sometimes we need to do things a few times to really understand how long things take us. And then schedule the time to complete the task and put it in your calendar or your diary. Okay, if it's not in the calendar, it won't happen. All right, and by doing this, you're also giving your mind, your memory a bit of a break. We've got so many things to remember. Let's give it a break and give it a helping hand. And lastly, treat every task like an appointment that you wouldn't miss for anything, like brushing your teeth before going to work, okay, or going to the accountant at the end of the tax year. You don't miss that appointment, do you? Because there's consequences, all right? So you're not missing it for anything. So we're up to step five, excuse me. Step five is resources. And I split this into two categories, you as the resource and other. So let's start with you. So you want to be asking yourself, am I the right person to even tackle this task? Okay, do I already have the skills, the experience or the knowledge required? If you're at work, are you the right person in the organisation to even be in charge of this project or be completing these tasks? Or if, you're, if it's a personal task at home, for example, do you have the skills and the experience to tackle that? Or do you need to hire someone to help you perhaps? So procrastination often happens because we don't feel confident in our ability to achieve the task. So if you're procrastinating on a project at work, ask yourself if you're really the best person for the job. And if you're in doubt, of course, talk to your upline, your team leader, your manager. Secondly is the other category. Okay, so do you have everything you need to complete this task? And if not, what do you need? So consider, oops, sorry, I moved too quickly there. Consider the materials, the skills, the time and the equipment. 
be very specific, include all the nitty gritty details to make sure that nothing is missed. Okay, and I think I was talking earlier about how specific I get. So this is the time to make sure that you've got everything that you need to get the task done. So just to summarize this point, asking yourself, am I the right person for the job? Or is there somebody else more suitable in the organization or around me to complete this task? And are there any additional materials, equipment, or anything like that I need to complete the task? And will you need anyone else's help to complete the task? Okay, so if you do, have you actually spoken to them? Do they know what you need from them? Do they know when you need it from them? And then do you have all the skills necessary yourself for this task? If you're the right person, you've got the materials, you may or may not need somebody else's help, but then do you have the skills necessary? Is there any study or research or a podcast you need to listen to, LinkedIn learning that you need to do to undertake before you begin this project? And then we move on to step six, which is accountability. Okay, this is one thing that I hear really often is I can't keep myself accountable. And staying accountable does rely heavily on completing the first few steps of this process, okay? you To keep yourself accountable, knowing your purpose, having clarity, they are really super important. So if you don't have these things or if you don't have a deadline, you don't have that realistic time frame, you are going to find it hard to stay accountable. So that's why these are steps for you to follow. At work, you're probably in a great position because you can actually use your upline your manager, your team leader to your advantage, okay? So you can establish a routine whereby you create a, an accountability buddy in them, all right? So if you have an agreement that you're going to help keep each other accountable, you might have a weekly or a fortnightly or a monthly meeting. So the important parts here are go to your meeting prepared, all right? Don't, it's not something to... Think about it the last minute, five minutes before the meeting, go prepared. Have that project plan with you. Mark off the items that you've completed and flag any areas where you have concerns or where you have questions and be sure to address them there and then. And if they don't get addressed in the meeting, make sure that you make a time for them to be addressed, okay? And walk out of that meeting either with a solution or at least with an action point or some action points for the next step in the process. Okay, so you don't want to walk out of there feeling like I didn't get anywhere with that. None of my questions were answered and I don't know who's responsible for what now. Make sure you leave that meeting with action points. And I'm sure that you've all heard this before, but this is the key. Repetition is necessary. Okay, you guys are here for a reason, listening to this for a reason today. Let this be your reminder. Now, if you work for yourself like I do and you're finding it hard to keep yourself accountable, reach out and ask for help. Okay, do you have a friend or a former colleague who might be willing to spend even 15 minutes or half an hour every week to check in and help keep you on track? There's a lot of networking organisations now who have these weekly or monthly check-in calls for people like me who work on their own, just to, I guess it's that it's that motivation to do something before that check-in call and it's keeping each other accountable and boosting each other. So think about what it is you need and then go and look for it because they are out there. So to summarize this, be clear on your purpose because it will help you stay accountable. You can always go back to your purpose. That will keep you on track. When you're working with a team leader, or an accountability buddy at work, be prepared. Okay, know exactly when you're going to meet, what questions you're going to ask, what you're going to discuss, and knowing what tasks need to be completed and where you need assistance. All right, we talked about asking for help, but make sure you ask the right person for help based on the task that you need help with. Okay, if you're working on a project and there's a large finance component, in the project. Don't go to your web developer for help around that, okay? Make sure you ask the finance person to help you with that particular task. 
And if you're having trouble asking for help, because I know this is a big one for a lot of people, a lot of us feel a little bit uncomfortable asking for help. We might feel like it's a failure on our part or we're embarrassed, but consider why this is. What are the barriers to asking for help? And begin addressing these because this may be a big reason that you procrastinate. And this leads us nicely into step seven, addressing limiting beliefs and fears. Okay, this in itself is a whole workshop, but here's a very quick look. Okay, so I'm going to start with an example of some limiting beliefs so that you understand what these are. I can't afford that. I don't afford enough, sorry, I don't earn enough money. I don't earn enough to save any money. I'm not pretty enough. I can't lose weight. I don't have time. It's a big one. I was born this way. I can't change now. I don't have a uni degree, so I can't expect a pay rise or a promotion. I'm an overthinker. Anybody ever said that? I'm an overthinker. Yeah, thank you, Kat. I don't feel well and my brain doesn't work. Yes, a big one. Because is it true? Does your brain work? Of course it works. (laughs) Don't shake your head. Of course it works. It's working right now. And here's a big one. I'm a procrastinator. Okay, this is a belief about yourself that is holding you back. Understand, Kat, we all have moments in illness where things are a lot harder. I fully acknowledge that. Now, these ones that I've put up here, these may seem like simple, casual remarks, but as we've already discussed, our language is very important. It makes a huge impact on us. And these are, in fact, limiting beliefs. Now, I again, I acknowledge that first one, I can't afford that. I totally get that there will be people in situations or each of us might be in a position where we literally can't afford it. If somebody said to me right now, Beck, there's this amazing course to do. It's going to give you this and this, and it's going to cost $20,000. I would say right now, I can't afford that. Okay. But it's things like, you know, if somebody said to me, oh, Beck, do you want to go out for dinner on Friday night? And my immediate reaction, because of what's been instilled in me as a child, is I can't afford that. But I really can. I can afford to go out for dinner. I'm making the choice not to do that right now. Okay, so I acknowledge that there are things in here like that one that may be true in certain circumstances, but the rest of them, these are generalizations and they're very rarely true. Now, I love, what are you saying here? Oh, a couple of comments here. Jane, thank you. I'm a perfectionist is always an excuse for procrastinating. Yes, absolutely. Now, I think you joined us a little later, Jane, but I do address perfectionism earlier on in the in the presentation. So I'd love for you to go back and watch the recording and see that part. And then what cat we've got, I call it custard brain. Yeah, I get that. When it feels like swimming through custard and nothing makes sense. Kat, I so get you. I have had a brain injury myself in the past and I get that feeling of custard brain. You're trying to engage, but it feels like the gears aren't clicking. Totally get that. That is your body also telling you that you need to rest. Okay. So again, this is why I wanted to hone in on that point earlier that procrastination doesn't equal laziness. Okay, because if you're in the middle of an illness flare up and you're on the couch or you're in bed, I I don't want you to be saying to yourself, I'm being lazy, I'm procrastinating. This is a real thing. You need to take the time to be kind to yourself. I know it sounds really cliched, but it's so true. And yes, it is frustrating. I get it. Okay, so these limiting beliefs, it's likely that these aren't actually true. These are stories. Okay, we've talked about excuses. These are excuses that we tell ourselves that hold us back from really realizing our full potential. In other words, they limit our growth and they can negatively affect our lives and our sense of self. As humans, we are wired to seek certainty in everything that we do. Okay, that's the left side of our brain. That's our ego always trying to jump in and save us. Okay, we are risk averse. And only consider investing energy in something when we're pretty sure that we can be successful, okay? This is that primal part of our brain that said, don't step out of the cave. 
there's something dangerous out there, okay? It's still kicking in and doing that. In other words, we don't like getting out of our comfort zone, do we? It's hard. When we don't really believe that we can get the results we want, we tend not to put in our best effort, okay? We sabotage ourselves. I'm sure we've all heard about self-sabotage. We've probably all said that to ourselves, okay? And we sabotage our efforts at the beginning and that tends to justify it to us like, see, I told you couldn't do it. And this is a big reason for procrastination. Now, I want to give you an example here. Let's say that the boss comes to you and asks you to apply for a promotion. Now, when the boss approaches you for this, it means that they believe in you. Yeah, why else would they encourage you to seek a promotion within the organization? And so you agree, okay? You agree to apply, but unconsciously, you don't believe you're good enough or qualified for the job. You know, and even though you're very competent, perhaps at your current role, you've got doubts that you can do this new job because maybe it's something or it's at a level that you've not done before. Okay, but pride doesn't allow you to withdraw, withdraw from the application process. So you unconsciously sabotage yourself. Okay, you put off collating your resume. You'll find excuses like, I'm too busy. I don't have time. This guarantees that you do a poor job on the resume because when you're procrastinating because you don't actually believe that you're good enough to get this promotion, you procrastinate. And so you end up doing this resume at 11 o'clock the night before it's due, which results in a poor application, okay? And you miss out on the promotion. And you say to yourself, see, I was never going to get that promotion. I'm not good enough. I don't have the qualifications. Okay, so your limiting belief in this case, in this example, led you to procrastinate, which means that you take a hit in the self-esteem department and potentially in the financial department too, don't you? You don't get the promotion, you don't get the pay rise. So it's just another example where procrastination is costing you. Yes, imposter syndrome, feeling like you're not good enough. But again, if we go back to it, this is a story that you're telling yourself, isn't it? Because the boss came to you in this example and said, apply for this promotion. You're going to be great. We want you here. Okay, so these are the stories that we tell ourselves. So when you find yourself procrastinating, ask yourself, what is really stopping me? Is the reason legitimate? Or is it simply a story that you've invented to keep yourself safe? Because when you replace these beliefs with ones that empower you to change your life, oh, sorry, they empower you to change your life, okay? So an example in this one might be that limiting belief might be, I don't have the education and skills needed to get that promotion. Reframe this perhaps to what skills and further education could I undertake to make it possible to get that promotion? Do you see how any negative belief can be turned around into more positive language? Now, I'm not saying that all you need to do is think positively. There's so much more to it. But that language is a big start. Okay, so look at how you can turn this around. So to summarize, here's how to identify these limiting beliefs that are holding you back and start changing. Okay, firstly, develop awareness. Awareness is a big part of this. Okay, begin listening to yourself and identify those limiting beliefs. Write them down, journal them, seek help with a coach to shift them, okay? Because they could be costing you a lot emotionally, mentally, physically, financially. And reframe them, okay? Instead of focusing on the negative aspect of the limiting belief, turn this around into a possibility, Okay, with a bit of thought, as I said, this is possible for any negative statement. It is possible to turn it around. And then take action. Okay, challenge your limiting beliefs and explore ways to achieve your goals and ambitions. But information is simply information until you take action. It will be uncomfortable. As I said, it's not, you're not going to rock up at work tomorrow and instantly be changed. Okay, you do need to put the effort in. But when you're uncomfortable, this is when you know that you're growing. So there you have it. These are our seven 
steps to eliminate procrastination forever. Purpose, urgent versus important, clarity, realistic timeframes, resources, accountability, and limiting beliefs. Now, this, I, this has been a super quick trip down the path to eliminating procrastination, okay? There is so much more included in here. Each of these topics are worthy of a full webinar. So here are a couple of steps to help you along the way to get started. All right, take action immediately. All right, schedule that time to talk to the boss. Put what you've learned today into action. Book the meeting, look at your calendar. As I said, information is only information until you do something with it. Now, if you want to delve deeper into this topic, we've got a course for you, okay? It's going to be released soon. And I'm going to give you the details here. I would love to offer you 50% off this course. So all you need to do is email me today at this email address, hello at moonbeammonday.com.au and type I'm all in in the subject line. And I'll give you a coupon code that secures that very special price. And for those of you who are in Adelaide, if you want to learn more about what's happening in your brain, and why we're doing these things. We do have an event coming up on the 12th of October, which you're welcome to come along to. It's a free event. It's called Mind Shift Mastery, and you can register on our website. For those of you who aren't in Adelaide, because this is a face-to-face event, we will soon have an online version. So we'll be able to share that with you at some point very soon. So I am Rebecca King. I'm from Moonbeam Monday Training and Coaching, and I want to thank you so much for your time today. And I would love to take any questions if there are any more. Thank you, Kat. Absolutely a pleasure. If anyone wants to raise their virtual hand by clicking on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and clicking raise virtual hand, I'm happy to unmute you. Jane has asked time blocking. Is it just manual in Outlook or is there a productivity tool that you would suggest? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jane. And it's funny that you bring up time blocking. I had a couple of things in here around time blocking and some other tools, but because of time, I took them out. Look, I personally use manual time blocking in Outlook because I love to be able to move things around and that just works for me. But there are certainly online tools. I know one that I've used in the past is it's Funnily enough, it's called monday.com, not related to Moonbeam Monday. And what I loved about that tool, and I'm not specifically recommending it or anything, I just know it because I've used it, but you're able to move things around there as well. But what I love is the ability to plan with dependencies. If you're if you're waiting to do your task because you have to wait for somebody else to complete something, that can go in this tool as well. And so you can see all the dependencies, move times around. And if that person is going to deliver something a week after they said they originally would, how does that affect what you're doing? And then what time does that give you back to do something else on your list? So yes, there are plenty of tools out there. It would just be a matter of jumping on Google and searching for them. Or if you're on a forum, ask people what they've used and why it works for them. Thank you for the question. And Rebecca, how do you feel about time productivity tools like Pomodoro, where you work for 25 minutes, take a five minute break? And how do you find that those are helpful? Yeah, look, for some people, and again, that's one of the things I was going to mention earlier, and I took that out of these slides because I just wanted to make sure we had time. There's these, the three tools that I recommend to different clients are that time blocking, the Pomodoro method, and also the two minute rule. So the Pomodoro method, just a little bit more for those of you who don't know, it's essentially looking at scheduling 25 minutes for each task and then taking a five minute break. Okay. And what I love about this is because I think one of the things, and we've talked about overwhelm a lot, is that we look at this task and we go, oh my God. It's going to take me ages, okay? And I don't have three hours or four hours or five days to do this task right now. Now, first of all, breaking your tasks down and having clarity on each of those tasks is super important there. But the Pomodoro method I love because 25 minutes, like it's a friend's episode, right? It's long enough to get something done, but it's also short enough that it's not an overwhelming amount of time. And then you can take your five-minute break and then you can either have another chunk 
on that task or you can move on to another task. So yes, I do love Pomodoro method. I also love the two minute method. There's so many little bits and pieces that we put off. I'm, I've am i actually got one at the moment. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I haven't swept my front stoop for a long time. All right. There's a lot of leaves on it. Now I've put it off, but it would take me less than two minutes to do it. So the two minute method is if the task will take you two minutes or less, do it straight away. If answering that email will take two minutes or less, answer it now. If making that phone call will take two minutes or less, do it now. If sweeping your front stoop will take two minutes or less, do it now. So guess what I'm doing straight after this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Good question. Awesome. Okay. That is us at time. So I want to, first of all, thank everyone for joining us and making this an excellently well-received workshop and especially big thank yous to Rebecca and Moonbeam Monday for a most informative and extremely practical and valuable webinar and presentation today. Thank you so much for that. Okay. So the next one that we have coming up is going to be on the 12th of October about how to increase funding for your NFP programs. So we'd love to see you join that. It's on the TechSoup Australia website and you can register there. And again, I'm Kat Milner of Create Your Change and I am your host today for TechSoup Connect Australia. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you.